Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the One Step Better podcast. Uh, you are in for a treat today because we got some rowdy bunch up here. Yeah. Um, I'm form. Let's go. <laughs> Don't turn on the video. That's all that's I got to right. say. Uh, I am Mike Schaefer, and with me today, of course, is Matt Patrick. Uh, Matt, welcome. Hey, everybody. Hopefully, we can get through this without too much. Pre content may have been better than the post content today, but we'll find out. Yeah. Becky I, always, she waits to push the record button. That way she can save all of her editing work. I like the beginning though. I'm waiting to see that edit. Yeah. There's going to be one of these times where we're going to get a nice. It's blackmail is what yeah. it's going to be. It's I need be a blackmail. raise, a big, big ass raise. <laughs> it's not. Today. I'm mm -hmm. pushing send. Um, yeah. I have backup. That's right. I did uh, not see anything offensive. If I did, it was Mike. Yeah. <laughs> You know, our listeners are out there thinking, what in the world is going on? So we'll get to it. Today, we're going to talk through something that uh, that we, man, we talk about this every quarter, something yep. that we always try to implement, tweak, iterate inside of our uh, our company. And that is training, teaching, learning, getting our employees uh, onboarded. How, how can we do that most efficiently, but also, and probably more importantly, most effectively, so that they can get up and running as quick as possible. If you think about you're bringing on a new hire. That new hire um, has a rent runway to get to a level of use inside of your organization. And the quicker that runway can be, the more productive that or the quicker that employee is going to be productive, which should turn into um, a, a better you know, return on that hire. And one of the ways in which you can do that is by effectively training your employees. So we're going to talk through kind of some of our experiences with that, ways in which we help companies uh, actually implement some training. Uh, and hopefully give you guys some ideas on ways in which you can take this back to your organization and start to uh, deploy it. But before we do that, um, fun fact of the day, I learned today that Guinness, the beer company, is also the company behind the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, I learned that because before Becky pushed record, there was some shenanigans going on. So today the question is, if you could be in the Guinness Book of World Records, Matt, what record-breaking feat would you attempt? I don't think they mean feet as in like you put your shoes on them. I may. No. You could. Um, I would, like we said, I think it would be like, and have to, I'm not very talented, so it'd have to be something very repetitive. I'm not very talented. <laughs> so it'd have to be like, hey, the most days drinking a beer in a row, or the most days uh, turning off email. It would have to be something pretty basic for me to do it. Um, I like the idea of, you know, in an idol world, like I threw the baseball the hardest of anybody in the universe. That's probably not going to happen. Um, it doesn't say it has to be realistic. Oh, then yeah, I want to throw the baseball harder than anybody else on the planet. How, how, what do you think the world record is for? I think it's like 106 or 107. Really? That seems slow. I throw 110 on a bad day. Uh, how many times you throw it? Kilometers per hour, right? Uh, Kilometers? I don't, know, I don't know how that conversion works, but sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I mean, yeah, I, I, here's a couple things like that, you know, athletic feats or speed. But the fastest human, I wouldn't mind being Usain Bolt one day. Dude, that would be pretty cool. Mine are all not going to happen, but it's not, it doesn't have to be realistic. Yeah. Um, mine would be something like crazy action oriented, like highest skydive, deepest free dive, you longest could, motorcycle totally, jump, something like crazy you adrenaline. You want to go flying with me, Mike? No, no I'd, chance. <laughs> I'm, I'm in for the, idea that would be the lowest <laughs> plane crash. <laughs> No. I don't think we would get a, a world record for Every that. Every plane crash happens at the same spot, Mike. <laughs> Every plane lands. <laughs> on zero, right? That's right. At zero. No, it, it would be something like adrenaline junkie type thing. I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I don't know what the world records are for any of those Biggest things. Biggest bubble but, I've blown with a piece of gum would be kind of the thing. I think I probably... They have like ridiculously crazy oh, yeah. world records. Like most times hopping on one foot or most times on a pogo stick or longest fingernails and... You've seen that stuff? Oh my god, it's oh, crazy. Yeah. It's gross. This when you when I was a kid and we went to the library. <sighs> that's the first book I went Yeah, you go get the Guinness book. The tallest guy and the shortest they guy had computers. and the fattest guy. It was crazy stuff. That was awesome. I, I that was honestly that and like sports um fact books were basically my go to readings. My yeah. whole my whole <laughs> that's elementary. how I learned how to read. Pretty much. <laughs> Guinness Book of World Records. Yep. Mike uh, Landon, he loves fact type books like that. So it's basin. He loves to read those and just, here's the random fact of the crazy thing is he remembers things like ridiculously well. And so he'll read something and then two months later, like, hey, did you know that? YouTube's kind of gotten away. I mean, basically Mason watches YouTube videos nonstop of this is the person who won the dunk contest in the last 15 years. And yeah, that's what he does. Yeah. yeah it's not the same. Eh, I mean, it's the same, but different. It's, not, it's different. We didn't have that technology have when I was a kid. 
I would have probably been a YouTube junkie if I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, but there's no what, doubt. What's Especially the school. first game control machine you had? Uh, for Christmas, when I was probably eight, seven, eight, nine, seven, probably seven or eight, we got a Nintendo. I remember that. We got a Nintendo for Christmas. That was the first one. I'm a lot older than you. You are. You are very much older. I had Atari. I had Pong. I don't even know. Atari was good. one button and one joystick. I've uh, played Asteroids. Atari. Asteroids, yeah. And then I had Coleco. Yeah. Anyway, my grandfather on my dad's side, he gave us a Commodore 64 oh, yeah. when I was a kid. Or and Andrew. it took me a long time to figure out how to even turn that thing on and make it work because it's like that's not a computer. Uh, but what I did, we played the games, and that was pretty fun. Yeah, Oregon Trail. and uh, We did. Uh, we had a little joystick thing for it. I don't remember. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? is what I, I do I, remember that game. I, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, so we had a Nintendo, and then we didn't get anything else <laughs> except for, yeah, you had to blow on it. Blow on it. Put like three games in one to make it whole to stay in. Yeah, and you got it. You push it just barely to where it's in. It has to like click down into the thing. Yep. But I didn't. I never had a Super Nintendo. Never had a Nintendo sixty four. We did have a Game Boy. We went from Nintendo to Sega Genesis. Was my. I never had a Sega. Sega Genesis was my college. That was my college years. Then we went to PlayStation. Yeah. That was at the end of my college, and then. Yeah, I had a PlayStation. When it, my We're an Xbox house now, though. We are too. My second job ever was I worked in the kids section of Sears over in Wolf Chase. I was, this was like late actually. high school, early college. And that's when the kids section is where the video game section was. And they had a Sega Dreamcast oh, set up. Sweet. And so I would spend. <laughs> You're getting paid to play Sega every day. <laughs> Probably too much of my shift was spent hey, playing kid, Crazy I, Taxi. You have next game. I haven't lost shit. Scoot over. <laughs> yeah. Go, go buy your pants with your mom. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I did. I, th that was Ten always. Kenmore is in the washers section. Go away. <laughs> and then they moved the game section upstairs to the electronics. I need to change was, my department, please. Yeah, it, I, I was that sucked. I quit. I quit. <laughs> I didn't quit long after that. Uh, it wasn't because of that. I think I got that job because of a girl actually uh, that worked there that I liked at the time. And that's usually how it works. Right? I impressed her by spending all my time playing, playing video games. Cast. You're cool. <laughs> That's so true. Oh, okay, anyway. anyway. Yeah, no kidding. We're going to get way off track here, which is probably about in line with a normal podcast. Yep. Uh, but today, uh, just to bring it back in, you know, if you were going to go and, and do any kind of long free dive or big sky dive, or you were going to jump over a bunch of stuff, you got to go through a lot of training you're to get to, there. You're trying to segue this <laughs> the hell out of that right there. You got to go. Well, yeah. Becky did a good job. She's like, oh, now for a different type of training. It's like, I, I pick up on what she's putting down. Yeah. And so uh, you got to do a lot of training to get to that. You certainly do. Yes, you do. <laughs> and one of the ways in which we struggled, uh, or have struggled and continue to struggle in some areas is that, that most effective way to get people up and running from new hire to fully productive or even remotely productive uh, mm -hmm. in our environments. We are, I would say we're maybe a little bit different than some of the other people listening to this podcast where we have professional staff. They're coming in somewhat credentialed, somewhat um, educated, or they, at least they should be pretty educated from a school standpoint. You know, they're going to have degrees that are in the field in which we're, we're going to be uh, working. But the way that we do things is extremely different than the way that they've ever been taught in school, especially in our accounting services side. Our payroll sides look very much different than this, but on the accounting side, they don't teach financial accounting in the way that we do financial accounting uh, in a lot of ways. Yep. And uh, it's just different. And it, we take a lot of time to get people up and running, understanding not just what to do, but how we do things. The way in which we do things is really important to us. Training them is difficult. Mm -hmm. What are some of the iterations that we've gone through over the years to get our people up and running from new hire to fully productive? Um, oh, the struggle always is the balance, right? I always feel like the struggle is the balance of, I need them to be productive as fast as possible. I need them to get a bunch of work done at all times. And yet I need them to continually be learning to improve. New employee, it's super hard too, because it's not just the technical they have to know, but it's the software and then technology we've implemented and the processes that we follow and how do we make sure that it's right, but also we're communicating well and all those different things that go into making sure we do a really good job. That is extremely difficult. Um, historically, um, you know, we probably do a lot of, I'll say, throw up training in the very beginning. It's like, here's all the different things you need to know. Now we're going to sit by you as you try to do it. And we hope you catch it on really fast. Um, 
We're just trying to get them acclimated with whenever we say this word, this is what it means. Yeah. I mean, the reality of it is, is not everybody learns the same way we find, you know, some people are auditory, some people are visual, some people have to get their, you know, kind of get their hands around it first. And um, it's amazing. I have three kids. They all learn a different way. I think our employees are similar to that. Not everybody learns the same style. We have a remote workforce today. So delivering training is delivering is training is a challenge. So you've got, okay, I can't necessarily sit physically next to you, but I got to zoom in with you. And I've got um, some work is challenging and I got some work that's repetitive. And you may see this one time versus you may see this one a hundred times. So all that stuff becomes super challenging. I don't think it's much different though than a lot of other businesses. It's in our world, it has to start with our process. Our process should dictate the technical work that we're doing. I then need to make sure you have the technical abilities, which is we do, we have a lot of supplemental training, but training has got to be a mindset that is just everywhere through our organization. So from new employee onboarding training to ongoing training to technical training to the quest to learn, I have to have the mindset that I want to always be learning. If you don't, you're just, you're not going to be successful here. Yeah. It's difficult because if you don't want to learn, then there's just too much that you have to learn mm -hmm. that you're just not going to enjoy it. One of the things that in the interviewing process, if you, you know, if you go apply for a job here, you should you know, mark this part of the podcast and listen to it. Because in the interviewing process, one of the things that we try to convey in, in our line of questioning and some of the conversations that we have is that we deal in a lot of technology. We use a lot of different softwares for a, a variety of reasons. And it is not intuitive for a lot of accountants to be involved in multiple softwares. They like, hey, I want to be this one thing and, and get to know that super, super well. And that's not how we operate. And, you know, the three month in 90 day mark, we go sit back with a, a new, a, you know, an employee that's in the door for that long. And it's, you know, there's a lot of stuff it, that one of the hardest things in that, that onboarding period, orientation period is just remembering all of this stuff that I have to touch in any given day. And it's difficult. It, mm -hmm. It's just because it, there's a lot to keep up with. And I don't think that's super abnormal for a lot of small businesses. Yeah, I mean, I think in our world, A, we're a white collar business today, very tech oriented. Tech -oriented. I mean, we probably have 30 software our client has, our employees have to know almost right away when they come on board. Um, some of them know those, the big ones, but they may never touch half of what we do. So then how do we reiterate that over and over again? Mm -hmm. So then you bring them on board and you did a training six months ago with all your team on that software, but now you have a new employee that has to do that same training again. So you're constantly repeating the same training over and over again. You also, we are constantly r and new technology. We may have changed software. The software could have changed between the training we implemented it and when it's now, or we're using it better today than we did when we did training two years ago. And all those things really, it's so hard to constantly be making sure that we all have that mindset of learning and sharing and you know, just that idea we have to share all the time about what we're, what we're learning when we're using the software. I always find that the software, because, you know, in our world, software is just the tools that we use. It's no different than a carpenter's hammer. Correct. Um, that part of training, to me, is easier to deploy to our team than the process stuff by which we operate. Because there's a lot of supplemental training that, and resources out there for, you know, how to use QuickBooks. They have their own pro advisor, you know, sections that we can point people to. In our iSoft training, we have a full university that's built out. Um, Bill.com has their own internal. So for like the software, how to use the tool stuff, they can get that supplemental from those vendors. They get a baseline. They, they get do. a good, solid educational baseline, but maybe not how we're using it. Correct. So between how and I, I can say, I can teach anybody to use QuickBooks. Can you use QuickBooks like an expert in our office? Probably there's a big gap. Yes. Yeah. Because that's where we're layering the tools with the how. So it's not just swing a hammer, it's swing a hammer in this very specific way in order to accomplish this very specific outcome. Correct. And layering that section above just the, all right, now you know basically how to use the software, the tool. Now let's teach you how we're going to do that inside of our environment with our rules and, and, and our, with and, our clients. And the why we use this tool this way. Yeah. That's the hardest part. And when that light bulb starts going on, software opens up for us. I would say all of our people that we've done a good job of um, on the software side is that they come in with the ability that we, we've, our interview process has, and hiring process has generally got us people that can handle software like we need them to. Which we is like curious people. Curious people that can figure stuff out if they're not sure they're going to ask questions. 
they're not afraid of technology. They've been on technology their whole life. They're going to be able to just grab and go. Now, granted, we have the specifics of what we do, but understanding why we use that tool that way is when the light bulbs really go off for our team. We're not generally saying, all right, click on that Outlook button. Correct. This is called an email. But I do remember, you know, 15, uh, 12 years ago, we hired a person that lasted two or three days when they didn't know how to open up Outlook. And I was like, our hiring process in that point failed and it failed miserably. I'm like, this person made no accounting. They cannot use a computer. They cannot work here. Yeah. And we didn't have anywhere near the resources we have now. I definitely couldn't afford to have a manager who could not use a computer. Yeah. And that's where we were. Yeah. And so to your point that you mentioned earlier, one of the things that we're struggling with now is that balance between the need for training with the actual time to do the training. I know that mm-hmm. this is something that you and I both with Kim specifically, that mm-hmm. is a Her recurring team. conversation is, Hey, Kim, how are we going to deliver training to our team with, Hey, Kim, how can I get stuff off of you so that you actually have time to deliver training to our team? Yep. And she does a really good job of balancing that, but it's a constant struggle because we have so much work that has to get done. How do we carve out time to do training so that we can bring up a next generation, the next layer We've, of people? So a couple things are, number one, I think it's creative use of time. So we're willing to pay for lunches. So we're going to do a lot of lunch and learn small trainings that can be digestible in 45 to 50 minutes during a lunch period or a meal period. We're also going to try to do as much as we can in our learn program. I would think that's the, that's the, and now that's not always ideal because not everybody learns that Same way. Thing. So we have to be creative on how we learn things, but the learn program has really helped us. I think that people can learn on their own schedules then, but also we can make sure they're progressing. Yeah. So to that point, what we did, I guess now about 18 months ago or so, um, and Caitlin in our office really spears up most, a a big portion of this, where we've taken kind of our learning curriculum, uh, built that out into kind of a map of how we want people to learn from new hire to up and running productive employee. And we've created content that's all stored electronically in our learning management system called iSoft Share and Perform. That is, at least I think that's what it's called. Maybe it's learn and something, whatever it's called. Caitlin's like, yeah, I'm, I'm it's not. It's learn. It is a, it's learn. It's learning something there because they just changed it anyway. In our world, it's learn. We're learning. We want to make sure the L- it's an LMS and yeah. that's, it's what it is. But what we, doesn't matter there. Yeah. What we did with that though, is we created all of that content so that it can be consumed at the learner's pace to some degree, but we have enough insight to be able to see, all right, Matt hasn't done this course or Matt needs to do that course and I can assign that out. And so it's a big project because now whenever, you know, Kim is sitting down and, and going through the onboarding of a client, now it's going to be recorded via Zoom so that that resource is kept for all of forever and can be distributed to other people as needed. Mm-hmm. It's, it's and, been and also, you think that we're adding, you know, we had five or six employees a year and Kim's always doing the training, which means that's five or six times that Kim has to do a training that she could have done once and record it. Now, we also, at the end of that, have a testing uh, phase so that we can make sure they've learned the content and then we can always evaluate whether or not they're actually able to apply the content. We can subsidize that training if we need to. We can go, oh, they're struggling with this still. Here's a refresher on this topic. Um, it gets out of sight, out of mind sometimes. We haven't done that process in a long time. So maybe we, you know, annually we do 1099s. But that year-end process for us to do 1099s, we may have new employees that haven't started yet. Or we have people that, Always do. Or we haven't, like, they didn't do a great job at it last year. How do we improve the process? We can go back to our training and go, here's what we should have been doing. We forgot this step. Those one-off things are always difficult to train mm-hmm. on because you, you could be an employee here for five years. But that means you've only done that one thing five times. Correct. And it's hard to become an expert on something you've only done five times over five years. Mm-hmm. And that the recorded training piece of that, the, the delivery of that, the expectation that our team is going to watch those things and ask questions and have follow-up attached to it, test what, and you know, some other items. But it's expected that that's going to be a little bit easier to do and more mm-hmm. repeatable, more systematized than, all right, guys, it's a brand new year. Let's figure this out together again. Yeah. And, and you know... I would say this is probably one of the most challenging endeavors. One of the most challenging endeavors we've had as a firm was how do we implement an LMS, right? How does that whole process need to work? Um, you know, that's something that it, it has the potential to be a never ending behemoth that you really never get your arms around. I would say that's not the mentality you need to have going in. It's the, what am I trying to do to reduce some of the other training we're doing and not replace? Because it's not a 
I'm probably never gonna get rid of all my other trainings and, and the upkeep of it is super important, but it does give me a, it gives me a system to try to systematize training so we can hold people accountable to learning. The LMS is simply a delivery tool. Correct. It's not the end all be all magic pill. I'm not to buying train. you a college degree through an LMS. I'm buying you the ability to go take another class. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the, the, you know, the biggest struggles with whenever we started to implement that, uh, you know, our LMS was how are we going to create all of this content? Because we sat down and mapped out, this is everything that we want on, on it. Like 800 and classes. It's really quick to see that this isn't a project that you finish. <laughs> this is an ongoing, constant, you know, just behemoth of a beast yep. that's going to have to be managed over time. Yeah. And it's easy to, you know, Hey, you feel like you've done it. Like we, we really did a good job of building out our sales and marketing teams, um, stuff. Hey, they, they, I say we, they owned it, went and did it, recorded the classes, got everything kind of figured out. That's great. That's one of our nine roles that we need to do the same thing for. It's very easy to get out of the habit of, okay, we have new employee coming on board. Let's go ahead and get some training done. And then, Hey, they started. Okay, good. We can breathe. But right as it needs to be a part of our routine every single week, every single month that we're going to do training and add and make sure that we're on the right track. Somebody has to own that whole process in your organization. And luckily we've done it. We've had a good person. Caitlin's really done a great job mm -hmm. of owning that. Absolutely. So one of the questions that Becky wrote down here, which I think is, is helpful is how often should you repeat your training kind of as a refresher to the entire team? Um, frequently. I mean, often, <laughs> often. Yeah. Re re repetition is the key. I think to anything, it's the same thing we talked about when we talked about, you know, values and mission. We have those things that are, uh, LMS, but we also talk about them in huddle and we talk about them in our monthly and meetings and our weekly team meetings. Um, I would say topically based, you know, software. We, so we have a tech training that we're trying to run now every couple of weeks in the office and we have different topics and those, those cycle through, we probably see the same topics a couple of times a year. Um, on each individual team we're doing, I know on the tax side, we do a tax update training. We have, you know, 20 hours or so a year that we're doing in tax update training. We also have new year end stuff every year, but we still go through the basics every year. Just a refresher on the big stuff. Um, you know, it's important that we stay up to date. It's super hard now with all the changes that keep happening, but it's super important. Overall training though, like I think it's assessment of skill that need to be developed deficiencies that need to be improved and then how do we find new process improvements to make and then when that happens we have to retrain the whole team again yeah the i, I forget who it was but there, i remember hearing a guy say one time if you said something once it's just an introduction and I, that like that's how training is in, in my mind if i walk through or, or show somebody how to do something once it's incompetent of me to assume that now they know how to do something from start to finish there has to be rep repetition to the things that they're, that they're going to do. And the balancing act of, okay, we have so much work to get done and to carve my whole team out to do a training again, how inefficient is that? The reality is it's actually more efficient. You're going to get everybody in the room together, talking through an improvement of a process that will make a, generally large strides in improvement. Those large strides in improvement create you more efficiencies in the long run. So don't think through the short-term effect of the training. Think the long-term effect of that training. Having a better team that's better trained is always going to make you more efficient. Sure. But I would also add there are some industries and some environments where a quick delivery of training is super important simply because they know it's going to be like, if you, I think about fast food yep. in the restaurant industry as a whole. I know that I got to get that person up and running in as quick as time as possible. One, so that they can actually get to work, but two, because they may not be here in three months, six months. And so I got to get as much out of them as I can as quick as possible. And that's where, you know, a, an effectiveness and an efficient delivery of training mm -hmm. is super helpful. You got to have some process for that. I know one of my PASPA peers is working on an LMS in their firm and their whole goal, their whole primary goal was how can we accelerate the overall time it is to someone to get from zero to full speed. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to measure that through their training. It makes perfect sense. So they have training curriculum and they have, um, uh, practice sets that they've done with fictitious clients. And it makes a ton of sense. The, I know in their world, they're at like 400 hours or 500 hours right now of development time, just in developing in their practice sets. And that's where the investment is just how much time do you have to invest? What's the purpose? In our world, our biggest efficiency is people development and technology development, utilizing our technology the best. 
And so that's where we spend our time and energy. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's super important. It's something that we are constantly trying to get better at and figure out Mm -hmm. because we understand that if you're not training your employees, if we're not training our employees, then there's going to be a big service gap at some point somewhere Mm -hmm. that's going to rear its head. And, and really from a true dollars and cents, it's going to show itself. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, and this is the struggle we've had, right? There's technical training versus soft skill training. So, I mean, there's training on time management. There's tra- yeah. you know, training on communications. There's training on, et- we have ethics training. We have to take every year's tax technical. There's accounting technical. So there's a lot of training that we have to do. It has to be a part of our organization that we all have that mindset. We always have to be learning. Absolutely. And if you guys are out there listening and you have some secret sauce, some magic pills to get your people up and running quickly, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at one step better at patrickaccounting.com. Or you could simply leave a comment wherever you're listening to this podcast, and I promise you we'll listen to it, read it, and even reply to it. So last week we talked about business trips. One of the questions that came in, which I think is, is important and probably helpful to talk about, is um, you know, typically if you're going to go on some type of business trip, there's going to be a tax deductibility potential with mm-hmm. that trip. What do people need to know about what is deductible, what's not deductible? How do I account for that? How do I keep up with those things so that I can substantiate my expense? Yeah, the big one is to make sure you document the purpose of the trip, um, what the event's purpose was, what the dates of travel were. Um, you know, if you are blending personal and business travel, say it's a six day trip and three days was at a conference and three days was not at a conference, and technically you need to allocate the personal side of that trip. As you know, half that trip cost is for personal purposes at that point. I would say most of the time, you know, there's a ways to make sure that that is, you just have to document the business purposes, even your non-conference day. So maybe it is travel to make sure you attend the right or, hey, look, I spent an extra day working while I was there in between the trip. Um, there's certain costs that are hard to justify. Like if your spouse, you know, goes along with the trip with you, probably the, that travel unless she, you know, is working in the business as well or, or he. It's very possible that they um, that part of the trip would not be deductible. Um, your meals, you know, keep up with your receipts. You know, document the purpose of the meal. You know, if you're at dinner while you're on a travel, a business appropriate trip, that's a deductible meal, 100% in 2021. But um, just make sure you're kind of documenting the whole thing along the way. Just for me personally, I'm curious. How often have you been involved or seen audits in which travel is something that's been a big scope? Travel is one that is often brought up in audit. Um, it's typically if you have a large travel expense number, the auditor would ask, Hey, can I get the details of the trip? Can you show me the receipts for the trip? You document the purpose of the trip and it, all, as long as you have it documented, you're good. You're good. The, the harder ones are, Hey, see you went on a beach trip, ran that through the business. What was the purpose of that trip? Well, CPE. <laughs> well, if it was in the Caymans, what, what was, well, that's fine. Show me the agenda of the CPE. Show me the, I mean, there's obviously in our world, there's all kinds of CPE training on the cruise ships. Perfectly fine, legitimate trainings. You just got to make sure you have the, you know, the itinerary. Um, the it has to one, be legit. It has to be legit. We, I mean, we had a client that had this happen and they are in the mortgage biz, business and they would have visited partners while they were, they had documented itinerary while they were there. They were there a week at four or five meetings, strategically placed throughout the whole week of the trip. They had dinner events, like, I, you know, I went to dinner with a client while I was at the beach last time and, you know, I ran that meal through, but the reality is, is like the purpose of that trip was a personal trip, but they end up putting some business into it and they were able to deduct the trip. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's always interesting to know. Or at least we got through audit. <laughs> it likes there you go. <laughs> Which is always the important part. <laughs> that means it counted. <laughs> that's so funny. Well, guys, if you're out there listening, thank you guys very much for listening to us ramble on a little bit today. Uh, really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to listen to us. Uh, like I said earlier, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. We would love to hear from you. Otherwise, make sure you click subscribe so you don't ever miss out on an episode and we'll listen or we'll hear from you or we'll, you'll hear from us, whatever I'm trying to say, next week on the One Step Better podcast. Mm-hmm.